Hi everyone, I'm James Haskell and welcome to What A Flank of the Podcast Series 2. My guest today is an award-winning comedian, presenter of the show 8 Out of 10 Cats and 8 Out of 10 Cats Does Countdown. He's known for his charming demeanour and his acid tongue. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Jimmy Carr. Huge, huge, great, great intro. Thank I mean, you. great. You didn't put my A-levels in there, but I get the idea. I'm a great guy. I've done a bunch of stuff. And you're looking great. Well of, well, of course, of course. Our lockdown has agreed with me. Like not working for a year, that's wonderful, right? Well, have you not been working? Because one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is what is well, a man who I was, I've heard many times described as the hardest working comedian. For you to do a full U-turn. I mean, that's, I'll stop you there. The hardest working comedian is like, that's the best looking guy in the Burns unit, right? It's like, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very low bar in comedy. And that's part of the reason I found it so attractive to get into because... No one really does much. So, great. But, I mean, I, I, I like to keep busy. Fine. I've been kind of, you know, I've been, obviously, I've been, I've been in the gym. Uh, you'll know. Uh, yeah. We share a physio. We do. We're, you know, basically, we're both gym buddies, yeah. right? Of course we are. Um, so, I've been, you know, doing that, writing a book, keeping a little bit busy, but I'm not working in the evening. So, it's kind of been, it's been the sabbatical I never would have taken. It's the, it's the year off I never would have given myself. When you're self-employed as well, I don't care how well you're doing. When you're self-employed, it's like there's a scarcity thing where you go, oh, I can't turn down stuff. I've got to do it. Uh, thus being on this, this Tim Pot podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Everyone's listening to this going, how the fuck do you get Jimmy Carr on your podcast? I'm pinching myself. I know my audience would be. Because you're, you know, you're a bit of a phenomenon. We've known each other a while, um, one way and another. We've kind of met a few times, a few different ways. And yeah, we've always, I mean, I don't really understand your sport. I don't, I, if I'm honest with you, I don't really know what a flanker is. I just, I mean, I presume you're good at rugby because people seem to have heard. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've zero interest. But you seem kind of like quite a, quite a you were going to get into cage fighting for a while, which I found fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good I just plan. That's, it's sort of the opposite of most sports stars' retirement. I, I'm looking for something where I can damage myself more. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of been my objective for life, really. You know, I, someone says, do this. I'm going to do the worst version of that and go completely mad. But I thought podcasting was a lot safer. Uh, and I thought it was a great opportunity to obviously um, to chat to you. I mean, I've seen in the papers now, I knew about this before, because obviously we, we do have a, a, you know, a good relationship. You, have, you had your lid and your teeth done, and you're looking brilliant. I got my teeth done about 10 years ago, which, uh, I mean, uh, fair, I, I don't know if any of you are watching the video there. Uh, there, It looks like someone opened a fridge when I smile. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, it's like it's, main uh, beam, constantly on main beam. I didn't go, I didn't go the crazy, because there's, there's like, there's the, they give you a thing, which is like 20 teeth in a row. And you go, I want that one. I want the whitest one. And they go, are you sure you don't want to go? Because Donald Trump has gone like a sort of a, a blue color, like it's properly shining. Uh, so you can kind of overdo it as well. You can kind of go nuts. But no, I've got a good little, good little dentist. And then I've got the hair transplant done, which, um, frankly, myself and the listeners were talking. And we're gonna we're gonna do a GoFundMe and try and get you to do yours because it's a disgrace. Oh, that's exactly what I was gonna say to you because most people, especially I imagine fellow comedians, I'm not regarding myself as a fellow comedian, even though I'm bloody funny. I um I was gonna say I'm not gonna come at you, but can we get a deal? Is do you have the guy's number because you're looking I, incredible? Well, it's a guy called I'll tell you who it is, and the listeners might be interested. It's a guy called um, Edward Ball uh, at the Maitland Clinic down in Portsmouth. <laughs> I'll hook you up. I mean. I didn't do like, well, you know this thing where people go, I'll get it done for free, and then he'll get the publicity. Fuck all that. I, I just went, look, I'll, I'll pay you in cash. If you do a good job, I'll definitely mention it to my friends. You're a friend of mine. I would, because the guy used to be a plastic surgeon. So his attention to detail is just like he's on it. He's like the, oh, we'll get that exactly right. It's kind of people go on about it being painful. It's literally nothing. I love it. Uh, by the way, just for all the listeners at home, I, we're obviously talking on Zoom. So I'm, there's my camera in front of me and you're to my left. So in case it looks like I'm never looking at you, I am. I'm just, uh, I'm just enthralled by, I answer down the lens and I'm looking at you just because every time you, right. I'm just very jealous of your fantastic hair. Um, you've obviously been in comedy for, for a long period of time, but that wasn't your first calling. Can you tell us a little bit how you started on this journey? Oh, well, I was like mid-20s. I kind of describe it as like a quarter-life crisis. Another way, there's kind of the midlife crisis is about like, well, I've worked very hard and you're not satisfied. That quarter-life thing of like going, I don't really know what my purpose is. And I was working, I was kind of in advertising for a while. I was academically, I did a bit too well. I was kind of educated beyond my intellect. And I was kind of searching for something. And weirdly, I graduated and my heart goes out. 
to the people graduating this year and last year. Because I sort of graduated in the 90s and there was a real sort of, there was nothing out there. It was really dead. And you just couldn't find jobs. You know, you hear about people. I heard about someone recently that applied for a job at one of the big consulting companies and didn't get the job. And their father happened to know someone at one of the consulting companies and went, you know, not to give you a hard time, but how come they didn't get the job? And he went, oh, there was no job. We just did the interview round. There was no job. We didn't employ anyone. We gave it to the interns from the year before. Like, it's it's, it's crazy. So I'd done this thing of like, I graduated, did pretty well. Um, Advertising, bit of marketing, ended up in Shell. Uh, Greta Thunberg would be livid at me. She would be. Uh, Actually, you're underplaying yourself because you're a graduate at Cambridge as well. Not only are you a great comedian, dashly handsome, you're also a Cambridge graduate. Is that right? Yeah, but I think that's just, uh, I, I, I mean, it sounds kind of impressive, but it's where uh, imposter syndrome was invented. So the reason the reason people do well at Cambridge is because everyone that goes there arrives on the first day and goes, and they were they were the shit in their school. They were the business. And then they get to Cambridge and go, I thought everyone's cleverer than me. I'm going to have to work twice as hard. So they get there, and after three years of working incredibly hard to, to keep up, they, they, you, you went, it's baked in, and you go, okay, well, now I have a work ethic. God, you goddamn fooled me. I've, I have heard that, that people go there and you suddenly have one conversation with your first lecture or your, or your one-on-one with a tutor and you're like, oh my God, these people are on a whole nother planet. Yeah, another level, another level. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, so that thing of like, you kind of do well and you, I think that thing of, there's a really, it seems to be a bit missing from, so like, we've got careers advisors in schools who are, I mean, I mean, I mean, all you need to know about those motherfuckers is they're careers advisors. So what do they know <laughs> about anything? And the idea of going, that seems to be the pivotal time is when you're when you're first left alone, right? By your parents, by society, you're sort of left, oh, what, what do you want to do? Is the time when you need it most because you're out of education and you're kind of going, right, what am I going to do? What's going to make me happy in life? How am I going to find my, what's my edge? What's the thing that I bring to the party? And... It's it's weird. I mean, yours yours is a really interesting story. I think in terms of being a sportsman, you have that later on. It's almost like you have arrested development as a sportsman because you're so good at this one thing. You really specialise. You're great at this one thing, and then at the end of it, you go, "Oh, I could talk about the thing I used to do. That's one job. Or what else yeah. can I do?" It's, you know, you you lent into your sense of humour. It's kind of kind of the same thing. It's so it? true, though. It is it is so true with that that you know. Most people, you know, we have two lives as opposed, you know, you almost, you've made two lives to yourself, but the average person sort of normally, they, they flit around and once they stay in something, they, unless they do have a midlife crisis, or we had another guy on today who had what he described as a midlife transformation. He went completely left field to come back to where he, he wanted to go to through um, some, a path of self-development. But that is, uh, that's amazing. My careers guy, just out of interest, if you wonder what they told me, <laughs> it was to be a farmer or a postman when I did my thing and they talked to me, what do you want to do? And I obviously, I don't know, I... I don't want a, I was, you know. A farmer or yeah. a postman. Yeah, that's what they career wow. advise me. I know. And how you low was that? Very little interaction with other humans. Mate, my, my parents, the amount of money they spent on my education, when I came back, I was like, Mum, Dad, they're like, it's careers day. Like, what do you want to be? They're like, you're going to be a postman or a thing. My dad was like, fuck it. I'm, we're not going to send you there anymore. So luckily I turned out as a <laughs> rugby player, essentially just good at hitting people. So it didn't really get that far from the, from the you know, the table. I but yeah. It is an odd thing trying to predict. I think people, though, don't have those careers anymore. Like, everyone is becoming a bit closer to a sports star because they, everyone starts out going, right, I'm going to do this. And, and then they end up somewhere, you know, life kind of gets in the way. And, you know, everyone's got great plans. I mean, you, you know, you want to meet some confident people. It's the, you know, 23-year-old with an idea for an app. Wow. Yeah, properly full on. But then, you know, shit gets in the way. Yeah. yeah but- I've got an idea for an app has become the new, I've, got, I, I've written a film. Yeah, neither um, have I. No, I love that. I've got, you know, because it probably was a book idea, a film idea. Now everyone's got a deck for a small, um, responsibly sourced business where they've got ethically sourced items yeah. and everything else, either that or a TV show or a film idea. Yeah, I do agree with that. Well, so what happened? What happened with the, so you were, you were in Shell, uh, you were working away. I mean, were you into comedy as a, as a kid? Was, did, did you? Did, uh, I mean, not, not, but not any more than anyone else. I was kind of into, I mean, my friends were funny. That was the currency of life is, is funny, I think. I think funny is like it's it's uh, it's 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 kind of a huge part of my life and always has been, but not necessarily like as a consumer of comedy. I didn't have the aspiration to being a comedian. I didn't think that was an option. I think most of the time in life, 
The stuff that really fucks you up is not the rules that are there in place. It's the ones in your head. It's it's the ones that you, the self-imposed limitations you put on yourself of going, I, well, I could never do that, you know, rather than going, oh, do, do anything you want. You can have anything you want. You just can't have everything. But is that what you did though? So you, so, cause I, was there some sort of pivotal moment where you were working for Shell, you were uncomfortable and then was the, the comedy aspect, a, a thing of exactly what you've just said of challenging yourself where you're like, I, most people would never do that. Was it the most left field thing you could do or how, how the hell did you go from Shell to comedy? What was the bridge? I, I think it was like that thing of like really thinking about what's your edge in life. What's your edge? What's the thing that you bring to the party? What are you best at? And really trying to analyze that. And really simplistically, I was a funny fucker and I went, right. I, people are always, you don't notice what you're good at some of the time, but you, you know, you don't think, oh, I'm really funny. You, you sort of might think, well, people are always laughing when I'm around, but you sort of think the world is smiling. If you've got that sort of disposition, you kind of think everything's, everyone's always all right, aren't they? Um, and then you kind of, you figure out, oh, that's a little bit special. So, you know, you lean into that and you go, well, I'll try it because even failing at that is better than succeeding in something you don't want to do. So I was wondering, that was your character then. So you were always the guy, like the centre of attention, making jokes, even when you worked in the office. Were you getting stuck into the, people? The, the office was really, I don't think you can beat your environment. I found it very stifling working in that office. And they were very nice people, but I found it, it was very stifling. But at school, university, all the way through life. I love that. I love that. I mean, did you ever, because um, in an office environment, even though it's stifling, if you tried to make jokes, did you more often not find you're offended, <laughs> you're offending people? Because some people in the... Like, no, it, I mean, you, you sort of couldn't make joke in that environment. You're, it's set up to be, it's, it's, you know, that thing of like, you can't beat your environment, get a better environment. Like your environment is, I, I think often it's like, um, you think it's your, the immediate sort of locale, as opposed to it's the people you're hanging out with. Like your environment is, is more than anything. It's the other people you're with. So be with more fun people. The thing I loved about getting into comedy was it kind of reminded me of being kind of 17, 18, going to university and like meeting a bunch of new people because you were constantly meeting new people and it was very social and very, it was fun. Everyone was on this little journey. I mean, it was, it was weird. It was like, that was around the year 2000. So comedy wasn't a business like it is today. Comedy was much more, you've left to join the circus. I remember I've been doing comedy about maybe three years. I remember a friend of my mum's going, are you all right for money, darling? <laughs> you okay? And I'm on fucking TV, love. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. But g- genuinely didn't know, how, how are you sustaining yourself with some, you know, ill-conceived dick jokes? Well, like, that's what we got as a rugby player. I, you know, so what else do you do? You're like, no, I'm a professional yeah. rugby player. player. No, but, no, but what else do you well, do? That, you? Is, that is a good question for rugby players, though. So, yeah. so, but you said obviously that the com- the comedy thing happened quite uh, quickly. You know, what was the initial transition? Because there's one thing being funny around people. There is another thing turning that into comedy that you can present to people. I, you know what? It's it's the I've spoken about this before. It's almost like you do a reverse. Your your life as a comedy um, uh, punter is reversed when you become a comedian. So, if you start out as a comedy fan. The first thing you do is you watch TV and, and you watch Netflix specials, you know, DVDs back in the day, VHSs. And then you'd go and see a big show, like at the O2 or Wembley. You might see someone super famous, guaranteed, great, he's going to be fun. And then you go and see someone at a theatre and they're maybe not as famous, but you like them. And then you end up at the comedy store and you're watching four comics. You don't know any of them, but two of them are great and two of them are terrible. And then you end up above a pub in a little night where everyone's doing 10 minutes and trying new stuff. And it's kind of okay. And there's a couple of people who are good and most of them are shitty. And that's where you start your career and then you work your way back to the stadium. So you're not like going to see Chris Rock live at Hammersmith and going, I could do that. I mean, unless you're mentally ill. You, you, no one's thinking, I could do that. I think I, I think I thought that when I was watching like Dave Chappelle or one of these guys on Netflix, drunk. I was like, I love making people laugh. I can do this, but you're right. I think I'm not all there. So that's Yeah, but I mean, right. it's, it's, it's the, uh, there's a name for that. Is it, is it Dun- Dunning-Kruger? Um, but people, people that don't know much about something, uh, uh, overestimate how easy it is. That's, it just, it, it happens in all arenas of life. So when someone's watching rugby at your level and they're watching on the sofa and they go, ah, oh, the coach is an idiot. Cause what he wants to do is that, uh, this, and then he would score the try. And it's because, oh, you're an idiot. You don't. <laughs> You don't know how complex this thing is. So we always overestimate how, how good it would, how, how much, you know. So you watch a stand-up comedian, you're seeing one step when it took a million. You watch an hour-long special that Dave Chappelle did. You don't see the 400 jokes he tried that got nothing and then 
he's 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 kind of panned for gold, and then this hour it's all killer. And you, if you just see the one step, you're forgiven for going. It's easy. Or if you see a guy score the perfect try in whatever your soccer ball thing is called, <laughs> it, you think, well, it's easy. Just run that way. You'll never catch him. I'm fascinated there's an actual expression for this. When we get off air, I'm going to watch that because I'm desperate to know that because in, in sport especially, everybody thinks they can do what they, the, the, yeah, they do, do. What you do. I think it's D- Dunning-Kruger. Dunning-Kruger. I love that. I'm taking D- so many Dunning notes. Kruger. I'm going to have a new vocabulary and a new lid by the time we finish this podcast, which cool. I'm very impressed with. Um, those early days, so what, what was I could your... be wrong, but also if I'm wrong about that, that's just because... Uh, psychology is more complex than I'm giving it credit because Dunning Kruger. But what is um, what, what was your shtick early on? Uh, what was your kind of thing? Because you're a well-to-do guy. You know, uh, you mainly brought no, up. In I'm, farm. I'm not particularly well-to-do. No. I I, uh, I have a um, I have an accent. P- people people see. I think part of the thing about life. One of one of the best thing best bits of advice is lean into what you've got. Right. So I don't think I'm that fancy a guy. I'm a, I'm from an immigrant family. Uh, of Irish immigrants that came over in the early 70s. And we grew up in Slough, in and around Slough, which is not the most salubrious of areas, but it's got full employment because there's a big Mars factory. And we had a, I had a pretty cushy childhood, but I grew up on the Farnham Road in Slough. That was my first kind of memories. I, I sound like someone who's kind of Lord of the Manor and went to a public school and maybe was... I didn't. I went to the local free school. And I, I speak like this because I've got perfect fucking diction but i'm not that i'm not as fancy but it's a weird thing where actually in life at some stage you just have to just lean into well if people see you in that way you are that way but that's what i was going to ask because when i did my research on you i know you're very down to earth i've heard you talk to about stuff and about you know not coming from that background but there's no getting away from it you're a bit like little lord fontleroy sort of quite you know smart and posh and accent i wondered i wondered um, my question was in those early days of comedy, did you lean in and own that? Because I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. I was, if anything, I was a little bit more clipped. That, you know, because you are. You know, you, I didn't do an act on stage where I was doing a character, but it was a version of me that was me in front of fifty people in a room, a little bit nervous, and so I was a little bit more clipped. And I'd, I'd sort of written these these jokes that were almost like was very influenced by Emo Phillips and Stephen Wright, who are kind of the best one liner writers. Uh, in the world, maybe Mitch Hedberg as well. Um, and I was influenced by that. So I was trying to do these perfect little lines. And the delivery was quite sort of almost staccato. Um, but I, I liked it. I mean, I thought that was, it was the same jokes I write now. Yeah, so that was your that was your vibe. The kind of, you know, you haven't, the, the one-liners, that kind of stuff there, as opposed to some of the meandering storytellers that you're storytelling that you see. Yeah, I, I, kind of, I figured out, it's quite old school, really. I don't think I would have picked it. I think if I was going to pick a style of comedy, I would pick um, storytelling and, or maybe, maybe doing something like, I mean, Chris Rock is, you know, a a brilliant, brilliant comedian. I mean, I I think he's on the the Mount Rushmore of comedy uh, every day. Uh, So that longer routine where he's making a very interesting political point is what I would aspire to, but you don't really pick your sense of humor. It picks you. And I think when you start doing stand-up, you think, oh, I quite like uh, political satire. Yeah, but I can't really write it. It's not really my thing. I often think it's a, it's a lovely thing in comedy that you, it's not like being an actor. If you're an actor and someone else gets the role playing James Bond, you go, ah, oh, but I can't do that. Whereas as a comic, if someone else makes a brilliant joke, you go, well, I could never have done that. When I watch John Oliver on TV, I don't think, oh, I could have done that because I'm not that kind of cat. Do you think that's why you've had the success you've had, though, because you identified your lane early on? Because my reaction would be would be to yeah, try 100%. and do, if I saw you, to try and do you. And then if I watched someone else do live, I'd be like, oh, God, I really like that kind of approach. And I would try to do that. You, you, but you were early on from doing these one-liners, and that was your kind of thing. Yeah, I think so. I think you, you, you also get better at it. You know, we live in a specialist economy. So, you know, and you, you might think that means, oh, well, rugby's your thing and comedy's my thing. But it's much more specific. So your thing is being a flanker. Uh, and my thing is being a one-liner comic and a gag guy, and those are that's fine. You can specialize as much. The more you specialize, the better. Because I, I found in in my area of, of of life and in rugby that northern people are afforded a much more kind of understanding because they're seen as salt of the earth. For example, I, I, I was talking to, in a team, and if I go right, chaps, we've got a really important game this weekend. We're going to go out there and, and, and do our best, or whatever, something more cere- you know cerebral mm-hmm. or articulate than that. And a northern bloke goes, right, lads, I'm not being fucking funny, but we've got a massive fucking game. We're just going to pile into these fuckers and beat them up. And everyone goes, yes. I wondered with someone like yourself who looks like 
you do going into comedy I, were you accepted or was it hard no i think i think i think it's almost the reverse for the kind of comedy that we do i think there's a as in as in pretty much every area of our lives there is a uh, bias against working class people um so someone like frankie boyle who's one of the country's greatest comedians he gets given a very hard time for being edgy and we do jokes similar levels of edge and i don't get Fine. given such a hard time and i think it's because that people think it's harsher in his accent because he's a working class scottish guy that in my accent you kind of get away with if i say cunt it sounds adorable yeah, I did th- yeah, I've never thought of it like that. You're right, actually. Maybe comedy is the reverse of everything else. Because if you just look on the Daily Mail online, if, if you've lost the plot and you ever want to do that, you'll just see in the comment section, if someone's northern, then they're afforded this kind of unbelievable freedom. And then if southern people, they're like, oh, wankers. But actually, maybe in comedy, you're right. It's saying in a northern accent, it's horrible. Mm-hmm. Say it from your... Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the north-south thing is maybe... Um, I, I, you know, I think, I think for me, the big thing in the UK has always been class. Uh, as, you know, that's kind of, that's the thing that's going on that people don't, I don't think they really talk about it enough, but that kind of, you know, equality of opportunity is kind of, that's the thing that's missing, right? Yeah, no, I, I, look, I, I think you, I completely agree. We, we do become obsessed with that. And the only reason I mention it is purely out of the, the rugby context. Um, I, obviously, I know the answer to this, but in those early days, you must have bombed a few times. Did you ever think, lose faith in what you were trying to do, thinking, fuck me, this is awful? No, I mean, you, I, I, you know, it's, it sounds so cliched and self-helpy, but, uh, you know, you, you, you win, you win, you lose, you learn. I mean, it's like harsh comedy gigs. You go, if it's, re- if it's like medium shit, you go, this is nothing. But if it's bad, you go, right, this is a fucking story. This is a story. There's, a, there's, a, there's an old joke as well about, like, this is what comics are like, right? So a guy walks into the comedy store and he's, he's a big star. And he sees an old friend of his that he started with. And he says, uh, he says, oh, I've just got back. I just did the new Spielberg movie. And the guy goes, oh, I didn't hear about that. And uh, he goes, no, because I did the TV show and it, we just won an Emmy. And he goes, oh, no, I didn't, didn't hear about that. Well, because I've just done a tour of arenas around the world. And he went, oh, I didn't hear about that. He goes, yeah, and I, just, I just did uh, five minutes uh, up the creek and I died on my ass. And the guy goes, yeah, I heard. Because, like... The, the bad gigs, like everyone's got bad gig stories and we love them. And that's the thing that other, because you could be as big as you want as a comedian and the audience will give you two minutes, like at the comedy store. They give you two minutes and then it's like, you better make us laugh. We're here for a reason. And the wonderful thing about comedy is how binary it is. You're either, you either laugh or you don't, especially with my stuff where it's a joke. I'm not telling you a story. I'm not telling you something that's incredibly personal and means something to me. I'm uh, uh, you know, this is just a joke and it's it's you, it's going to fail or it's going to be OK. So really, my deaths tend to be much more in the moment rather than over a gig uh, because you- I can pivot. If I'm halfway, if a story goes nowhere for Jim Jeffries and it's 35 minutes long, oh, he's at a disaster. Whereas if my joke doesn't work, I go, well, there's another two in this minute. I'll be all right. Yeah I, yeah, I never thought of it like that. Actually, you're right with the storytelling. The danger is you've wasted so much of your time trying to get to somewhere. If you don't get anywhere at the end of it, you're stuffed. But like you said, you can just pivot on the spot. I mean, are there any moments where that you remember fondly, like crowds in particular, or moments that you thought, you know what, this is making it all worthwhile. I absolutely love what I'm doing. The whole thing. I mean, the whole, the whole, I think you have to love the whole thing. So if you like being on stage, then uh, great. You like, you like being on stage. That's such a tiny proportion of your life that it's not going it, to, you won't be able to sustain for that. You'll, you'll go mad. So you've got to like the whole thing. Really, what comedians are is they're writers who also, they're singer songwriters, right? It used to be you had Tin Pan Alley, those guys wrote the songs, and then you had the singers and performers, and they, they got the songs from them. And it feels like there was a big shift in music, and it was singer songwriters. With comedy, it's that. It's like we're doing the writing, and then we're getting up there and performing it. That's the fun bit. That's maybe the, the, the showy bit, but writing something that you, you can't wait to try, that's kind of a kick. That's what I was going to ask you about how you actually create this, this comedy. Because I, was I remember rightly, you do a, or did do a podcast like The Writer's Room, was it? Was it or you yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I did a thing very, very early on, first sort of days of podcast. I did a thing with uh, some friends of mine where we just kind of wrote jokes sort of live. Because I listened to that. I actually listened to that before I'd even met you. I'd, uh, you know, obviously I'd, it came up on the well, podcast. Well, it's, it's an interesting skill set, like writing jokes, because you're sort of reverse engineering. You're sort of going, give me the topic, 
what the things around it. You're sort of trying to think laterally. It's it's very good for kind of. Uh, I mean, it rewards linguistic ability. It's like that thing of like going, well, how can I turn this this on a sixpence? How can I how can I say something unexpected? Basically, all jokes work in the same way. It's the sudden revelation of a previously concealed fact. So you tell a story and you think it's going in one direction and then suddenly it goes in BTS. Do you have a method for doing it? Because obviously a lot of what you say, even though it's one-liners, is like really relatable. You know, you keep it relatable because, it, you know, people, it's it's kind of common ground stuff that, you know, it, it, mm. do you write with people? Do you, do you sit and write a notebook I mean, out with jokes? Shows. For TV shows I do, yeah, for all like 8 out of 10 cats or Countdown or Your Face or Mine, something like that, I'll sit down with Dom English or Christine Rose or Sean Pye or, you know, any of those kind of guys will sit down and write it together or more often than not, we'll write it individually. You sort of sit, when you say writing together, you could often be in a room together and you're writing individually and then you're running it by people because jokes kind of don't exist until they're told. It's like you could sort of think it's the funniest thing in the world. If you say it out loud in a room and everyone laughs, then great. That has got to hope with an audience. And if everyone just goes, yeah, it's it's nothing. How often do you freshen up your stuff or do you feel obliged to do it? Because I was talking to um, one of the DJs that I've interviewed before, Nick Fanciulli. I was saying, how often do you mix up your sets? He goes, well, every now and then I add new music. But, you know, it's the assumption that everybody's seen what you're doing. And if I'm going to different parts of the country, not everybody's seen what you're, you're putting out yeah, there. Yeah, I suppose the, a tour, you basically write a tour and then you take that on the road for, you know, two years or whatever, and then you write a new one. That's how I've always tried to do it in the past. I'm slightly, I think post-COVID, I think I'll probably spend the next six months, a year, when, when we get back, just kind of messing around a bit more and doing more new stuff. Because I've got such a backlog of stuff I've written in the last year that I'll just be excited to try new things. Do you bring your friends up to test your jokes? Do you have like a WhatsApp group of other comedians that you drop it in? No, I, I do the uh, I do that thing of like occasionally at a dinner or something, I'll throw something in. and if But it's heartbreaking if it doesn't get anything. And you, you kind of go, oh, right, that's like, oh. Uh, and you, you kind of... Uh, I think you can only really test it on an audience. It's not, you haven't tested it on one person because you could do a brilliant one-liner and just get a bloke going, all right, it's good. And you tell a thousand people and they just, they belly laugh. There's a, there's a weird thing about the, the audience is a genius. The audience knows. I love that. I love that. I mean, I wondered if there was a WhatsApp group, do you want to put me in it? Just test out some jokes or just send them to me? I know you said you don't do it individually, but I'll give you a good appraisal. Cool. No, thanks very much. Yeah, you, <laughs> you just oh, retweet re re them. No, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. I just nick them. Well, it's, a, it's a it's a weird thing about stand up as well because like Twitter, you can occasionally some people put brilliant jokes on Twitter, and I sort of read them and go, "It's a great joke." Why are you putting it on Twitter? Because it doesn't work on Twitter. People don't laugh in the same way when they're looking at a screen on their own. People, you know, it's a social activity. You laugh when there's like thirty people in a room, and it's 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 you. Then you release the endorphins. Then it's worth something. Are you kind of um, the classic comedian, sort of, you know, there's the portrayal of the sort of sad clown, like you, you thrive on the energy and the laughter, but behind that you're quite quiet. I mean, I know that you're not like, you're always a ball of energy every time I've seen you. I've never yeah. seen you any different, but. I don't think that's, I mean, I, I would, uh, I put it to you, that is not the, it, the irony is so delicious that people think, well, I mean, it must be that you're the, you know, yeah, you're really uh, depressive. I think comedians tend to be quite um, complex people. I, I don't know. I mean, for me, I think the the most the thing that unites most comedians is a sick parent. That seems to be the thing that if you were going to sort of play at being Freud, you'd go, there tends to be a parent that was sick mentally or physically, and you had to make things okay within the home. So you fulfill that role, and then you look to fulfill that in the world. You look to make things a bit better. Uh, certainly for a proportion of comedians, that's true. But I mean... I'm always amazed how many comedians haven't killed themselves. Let's focus on the positive. Well, cause, yeah, because because down to that rule, you would think a lot more of them would, but they never do, which is you know, which obviously is a is a plus side. I do think though, people with um, mental health issues tend to be drawn to comedy. You get quite a lot of people coming up to you after shows, um, sort of saying, "Oh, that really helped me through a very dark time." Uh, which is it's interesting actually that thing of like going, knowing that if you're in a depression, uh, the endorphin release of comedy is a very valuable thing. If you can. It's almost impossible, though, to get your shit together when you're depressed, to go to a comedy show or to go to watch something even that's going to cheer you up, that's going to put you in, uh, you know, because it changes your physiology when you laugh. What was your, out of interest, sorry, you know, going back a stage, what was your first sort of TV moment? Because things, from what you've said, happened quite quickly for you. What was your sort of first thing into TV? Because you've sort of straddled 
both lines pretty quickly? <laughs> yeah, the first, I mean, I do quite a lot of telly. I mean, I would, I would always think of myself as a stand-up. I mean, that's really where it's all come from, is stand-up comedy. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that, I mean, there's never one moment you can sort of point to, there was, I think, a, a, a Royal Variety performance that I got off the back of doing this tribute to uh, Peter Cook, which went very well, I remember. Uh, and then I got Your Face or Mine pretty early on. That was the first sort of uh, show I did for Channel 4. And then there was kind of bits and bobs before that. You know, it was really Edinburgh and then kind of I was around. And I think it was literally I had a suit and I looked like I should be presenting TV shows. Because you were a proper grafter. I mean, you know, at some point early on in the days, they were saying you were doing sort of 300 gigs a year, doing everything, weren't you? Was that that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, that was very, I mean, it was quite deliberate in terms of going, I, I wanted to, I, I sort of thought when I was about sort of 26, when I was doing this, that I'd come to it very late. I sort of thought, because a lot of people kind of do it straight out of university. And of course, they never realise how lucky they are because they never had a proper job. Uh, so my thing was like, well, this is great. This is easy. I'm only working in the evenings. I was having a great time. It was like, what else would I have been doing? My, my problem is work is more fun than fun. So if I have a night off, it's like not as good as a night at work. Terrible. What What is it about it though? Is it just is it endorphins release making people laugh? Like, do you still get nervous? Do you still get that um, intrepidation of like, is this going to work? Because, because, I imagine I do a bit of after dinner speaking and some jokes that in some place absolutely killed it. Is that what we said completely fail or things you think no one's going to laugh at? They laugh at. You must still have that kind of nervousness or are you pretty good with that now? I'm, I'm pretty good nervous wise. I mean, I suppose, you know, going back and doing a new show when you haven't done a show in a while, you know, the first time or the first time you're sort of doing a new tour when you're warming up new stuff, you could get a little bit, oh, am I going to fumble this or that, you know, I really need to land that punchline and it, especially if it's like a little feat, if you're doing kind of a complex little thing verbally and you want to, and it doesn't work if you don't get it exactly right. But no, I mean, you know, the, the, the nerves thing I think is, is more to do with uh, in the first kind of couple of years when you're doing it and you're in a, in a new situation. What I want to talk to you a, bit, a little bit about is the, you know, you, i always feel you straddle the line between kind of being shocking, shocking, funny, relatable, um, you know, and people obviously you can choose to get offended or not. I mean, do you, do you struggle with people taking offense? Are you worried about that kind of stuff now with, with, um, you know, cancel culture? Not so much. I mean, I, I kind of, I take a lot of, um, I suppose, um, comfort in the fact the joke that ends my career, I've already told it. It's out there. It's on YouTube somewhere. And it, it was acceptable when I said it. And then at some point it won't be acceptable. And I guess I'll get canceled. I think there's, there's cancelled and there's cancelled, though, isn't there? There's like, there's the idea that you would go, could I tell a joke that would stop me from being on television? hundred well, percent. But selling tickets and live, I think people that like you and share your sense of humour, there's a uh, people are very forgiving, and I think people have got, I don't know, I sort of feel like the papers sometimes get offended, and they underestimate people's intelligence. I think the general public have got an incredible sense for intent. So they really know with a joke, did he mean that or just a bit? And because I tell jokes, it's hard, you know, even for a journalist to take it fully out of context and go, oh, well, he made a point about this. And you go, no, I didn't. I find that fascinating because because Jim Jeffries actually was quoted saying, you know, a, a joke I made in 2008 was funny 2008 and was acceptable in 2008. Don't judge me by today's standards when I've I've tempered what I've what I've said anyway. But it's fascinating that you already yeah. sort of feel like that. And I, I think so. You know, my, my wife um, Chloe, who, who who you've met a number of times, she we talk about stuff, and I sometimes put videos out there about things, and you know, I. I try to be funny. I don't think I sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm just trying to get my message across. And she's lost clients because I've said stuff and it's, you know, perceived as offensive. Um, I almost feel like comedians, actually, you kind of have a bit more leeway. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know how fair that is. It feels like we, we kind of, I feel a little bit like I've been grandfathered in. I think if I was starting in comedy now, I wouldn't be able to be as true to my sense of humor. I think you'd still be able to do it, but you'd probably go, well, I won't say that and I won't say that because I don't want to be seen as that kind of comic. Whereas I feel like I can joke about everything. And if, if everything's okay to joke about, there's, there's nothing that's too terrible to make a joke about. It's like saying that disease is too awful to cure. You go, no, you can, you can joke about anything. Because, uh, you know, 
the 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 uh, uh, genocide is never funny, but a joke about genocide can be funny. And you know, there, there's there's lots of examples of things that are just horrific in life. But what happens is you conflate the thing and the joke about the thing, you, and you go there the same. And sometimes I think we do it out of frustration because we can't do anything about the thing. So we say, well, you can't talk about that thing. You can't even mention it because we feel a bit powerless to do anything about the, the awful transgression that happens in our society. But you're being logical and you're intelligent. I understand exactly what you're, you're trying to say. But majority of people, I feel, some people are prof- professionally <coughs> and perpetually offended now. Yeah, I, yeah, but, but, the, but the general public, I would say, the, the public that I meet, the people that I meet in the streets, I'd, I'd say everyone's pretty bright. Fine. I think there's, I think there's, a, there's a thing. If you read the tabloid press you might think, people must be idiots, people aren't idiots. There's like, I I just don't see it like that. I kind of think you have to, and ultimately as a comedian, you kind of have to be true to yourself as well and go, look, I think people will get that I'm joking. I think they'll get that I'm trying to make them laugh over two hours. You also have that, I mean, it sounds a bit like you're being defensive, but it's a big difference between telling a joke at 10.30 in a theatre to a paying audience and shouting it through someone's letterbox at 9 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, I agree. And ultimately, the papers are just, the papers are like printing a joke. They're printing what I said. I did say it, but, you know, written down, it doesn't work. There's no, there's no intonation. But then you see someone like Kevin Hart around the stuff with the Oscars, you know, when they came after him because he made some, you know, what people regard as homophobic jokes and he, he didn't apologise. I mean, do you feel... Because I'm not a big for per- believer in apologising for stuff you said because it's being taken out of context. Do you ever feel the pressure to do that? Do you feel the pressure to temper yourself in any way at the moment? Yeah, I mean, they took, the, well, they took a thing that Kevin Hart said as if he was making a political statement. And, you know, he was trying to be funny. And, well, you know, whatever you think about uh, uh, what he said, I mean, he was tr- trying to be funny, a comedian on stage. It's not a political statement. It's not like, a, well, vote for me because I think this. It's like someone trying to be funny. And... I, don't, I, mean, you know, I think the, the, the here's, here's my issue with cancel culture is it's, it's all very well cancelling people, but you need to have um, forgiveness and penance built into that system. Otherwise, all it, all it can do is burn. It's, it's kind of real, really just a blunt instrument of going, well, right, we get rid of you, we get rid of you, we get rid of you. But you end up with, uh, uh, who's left? Yeah, but I, I, I find a lot of these people... That person, because everything's happening right now all the time. Everything's, it might as well be live on YouTube, right? Everything you've ever done. At this conversation yeah. can surface in 20 years' time. Yeah. And you go, right, okay, what, what, do, you know, that thing of like, we cannot forgive what we cannot punish. We almost need like a cancelled jail of going, right, three months, your Twitter's taken away, and that was a silly thing to say. Okay. And then, I don't know. Well, some, almost like an metric. orange, almost like an orange card. So, you know, or, or you know, because yellow card, you're sort of big. Well, maybe like even the yellow card, that sort of happy medium where you're given a yellow card. Because it's interesting you say that. I, I find a lot of these people who want to cancel everything, they're like locusts on a on a thing. They move to the next thing so quickly, and there's never any compassion. They demand compassion and get offended. Yet they're the first ones to knife and burn everything without any kind of logical thinking. Yeah, I think as well, but there's lots of different types of, you know, people out there as well. I think the, the idea of saying, um, you know, you're, you're, you're offended, you know, some, you've got the right to be offended. I mean, I, I'm a real believer in free speech in, in, in that I believe not only is it okay for me to make the joke, but it's okay for you to say, I think you're terrible for making that joke. Saying I don't think anyone should be able to hear that joke is, is a slightly different thing. I think you should be allowed to say that, but we're not doing it. How do you filter yourself? Like, you know, or, sorry, I, I know you're true to yourself. But I just wonder. You've seen my show. I mean, I don't. No, really. I know. I know you haven't. I, I, I just, I'm trying to think because you and I've, I know, you, don't, you know, we, we've talked, we joke about stuff and, and I know the way you are. You don't, but I, there must, I mean, do you ever feel like you get it wrong? Or do you ever feel like, do you, do you, is there a mate you check in and go, because I check in with Chloe. And, and again, she's much more kind of, um, in certain aspects, conservative. And I'll say this, I'll go, I'm going to say this, babe. And she'll be like, no, like you can't. And I'm like, if and more often not, I'll be like, fuck off, I'm going to say it anyway. But she makes it food for thought. Whereas I know with your show, yes, you, you're true to yourself and you're true to your thing. But I wonder if there is some sort of switch where you kind of think a little bit more. I don't know. I think, I think for me, it depends how funny it is. Fine. If I, re- if I think it's fucking hilarious, I'll go there. And if I think it's, no, nah, it's okay. I just, uh, you don't need the heat. Is it a hill you're willing to die on? Fine. And, and, and there's, there's something on the, yeah, it's not worth... 
I'll leave that alone. Fine. Because I always operate the policy. I, I said it to my teammates. If we're sitting around a table and there's 10 of us and I've made nine people laugh and one person's crying, that's a win for me. I'm not, it's not, it's not, that's not a problem in, 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 a, in, a, in the nicest possible way. Without, I'm not victimizing yeah, that person. Yeah, we've all got, you know, but it's, I, I suppose it's that thing of, uh, I'll never tell a joke where I've got to look around before telling it. I, you know, I, I think that thing about going, if you've ever got to look around, you know, you need to check yourself. So it's that thing of going, I want it to be entirely inclusive. I want it to be, if I'm making a joke about disability and there's 15 disabled people in the front row, fucking great. Fine. Great. I've got no issue with that whatsoever. So that to me feels like a pretty good, I don't know if it's a policy or a, but you know, that idea of going, it has to be inclusive and it has to be something that you're, you're proud of and that you'll stand behind. It's very interesting you say that because it's like sort of an elderly relative making a racist joke and they sort of go, and then with that action alone, yeah. maybe it's time to just I mean, to wind that in. It's yeah, it's, I've got a whole bit about it. It's, it's the, the, the ludicrous nature and, but things are things are changing fast. I think I feel a bit bad for for older people. I mean, not just the COVID, but the 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 idea that you would go right. We're changing the rules. Uh, we're not telling you we're changing the rules. Yeah. Good luck, everyone. Yeah. And I, I think there should be like a like a, a maybe a little bit of a a yellow card's a good idea. I've got oh, you know, we don't say that anymore. Yes. Like no one's more woke than me because I'm slightly, I'm in the world where I have to check that shit. Yeah. I have to know what you can and what you can't say yeah. just to know where the, where the line but is. It's but it's funny you said about going... changing the rules, you know, but on so many subjects, like, well, by the way, this, this was absolutely okay. We used to, everyone used to do this. Oh, and, and now we don't do this at all. Well, let's look at, look at, look at shit that's clearly going to come. Like, look at, look, we all can see the future, right? To a lesser or greater degree. Do you really think the British Museum is going to be there in 10 years' time? It, I mean, shit we stole, right? The Commonwealth Games. You think that's running again? Do you think? Commonwealth? I mean, I mean, good luck with a promo, people. Good luck. Because it, it feels like it's changed so quickly. And then those things that we kind of took to be, oh, no, that's okay, isn't it? That's shit we stole from around the world when we had an empire. Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, people have got a problem with that. What? <laughs> yeah. But no, but we did that years ago. We stole it years ago. What, you still want it back? Oh, okay. But that's like with the rugby, when, we, when people always say, you know, why do, what's it like playing English? And I was like, everybody hates English. And I was like, why? Because when we had empire building, I said, you know, that's why we don't really celebrate St. George's Day that, that well. Because if you do have a St. George's Day flag, more often than not, you're a leader of the BMP or some sort of member of the EDL. But the well shown that, and everyone's united in hating the English. I think you're exactly... <laughs> I think exactly right. You know, we're going to have to be very careful because... It's, it's interesting. I, I'm a huge fan of uh, Stephen Pinker. You know, the guy that wrote Enlightenment Now. Yeah. It's a brilliant book to read, actually, because, you know, the last couple of years with, with everything that's kind of happened, uh, I suppose, Trump and Brexit and kind of populist nationalist politics and then COVID coming in and it feels like, oh, my God, the world's in a terrible state. And then you read Enlightenment Now and the guy makes a very good point for saying it's better now than it's ever been. You might think it's shit, but it was shitter. Yes, and that's true. I mean, uh, well, actually, we, 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 there's a lot of people trying to make it as shit as it was before. Because, you know, for example, with the, I, mean, I don't know where you stand on the vaccination thing, I'm not going to get into that now. But as an example, go to a graveyard, see all the graves of, of young children dying before they were vaccinated. And then there's a period of time and then there's no more child graves for a period. And that, that was when you would say it was a dark period of time. Women dying in childbirth because no one had any hygiene. All these kind yeah. of things. And then you look at it now and we're like a little, we're upset about some things that needed to change. But you're right, it's not bad. Most people have got water, you know, food. Well, you know. I mean, sadly, that isn't the case. I mean, here's the thing. The future is here, but it's not evenly distributed. Yes, I, I guess. My agreed, favorite agreed. quote, that William Gibson quote of going, yeah, there's, yeah, we've got clean water, but they don't and, no, you, know, no. you don't have to travel far. Eight hours in any direction on a plane and you can find someone who's thirsty. Yes. I mean, no problem at all. The, so it's, it's a weird thing. It's a better world than it's ever been, certainly in, in the West, and it's getting better everywhere. So ultimately, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, there'll be gay marriage in Saudi Arabia, but it's way out there in the future. But it's, it's, it's going to happen. Do you not Every, see people... Everything's moving in, a, in, a, in this kind of direction. Do you not see people trying to rebel against it, though? For the, the, for the same amount of people saying, you know, this has changed, we've got others saying, well, I liked it the old school ways. I like, you know, I think, like you said, you know, people know the context of humour, but I also feel people would stand up against this woke but I think thing, inverted commas. I think, uh, I, I think the, the issue with that is it's, it's an imagined past, isn't it? Yeah. It's an imagined past of, like, uh, 
uh, make America great again, uh, you know, is the slogan you got. It's an imagined America. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's, it's, it's a land you're, you're never going to visit and you have no idea what it was like there, you know? So you might think things were great in the wild West, but then you go, Oh, right. There was no deodorant and or toothpaste. Everyone, di- everyone died at 35. Yeah. Everything I mean, out that was trying to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. What was, um, one thing, I mean, you do a lot of corporate work. I've seen you at events myself. <laughs> not the last year, my friend. No, not, not the last year. Not the last, have you not done any virtual live stuff? I've done a couple of zoom things. I've done a couple of quizzes like for companies, like sort of not the big fat quiz of the year, but like some sort of little quiz about the company or about so just a general knowledge thing. They've been really fun. I haven't done any stand up over kind of Zoom or the internet because I kind of like it to be special. And for me, uh, you know, I've been very lucky that I haven't really had to. Uh, and also, you don't want to take bread off anyone else's table. If they're doing stand up gigs on Zoom, they need it great. But I've kind of, I've, I've waited. I've done a couple of corporate things, but I really, I used to love doing those after dinners. I love an after dinner. Everyone's all dressed up and a little bit pissed. Easy gig. But, but have you, with the corporate world, has that changed? Because out of everything, because companies are so perpetually scared of um, offending people, you know, like, I think you're right. A normal audience, so like, you know, Hammersmith, the average person in the street, you saying a joke at that time, brilliant. I think there's, there's, there's a status thing with comedy, in my opinion, which is it's, if someone has paid to see you and they're, they've paid to be in the room, you can go much further than if you're a guest in someone's home. So if I'm on television, I'm a guest in your home. And you might say, oh, well, you could turn it to another channel. But I know a lot of people have just got the telly is on. It's just part of the furniture. It's always on. And it happens to flick on my show because I come on next. So you've got, it's a different level live. And then there's a different level on TV. With something like a corporate gig where you go, look, someone's here from HR. And it's their job to make sure that no one gets. So it's a slightly different, you know, I, I, I don't have to be there, right? I can, I don't need to turn up to the corporate gig and go, right. I'm doing this corporate, but I'm doing it my way. Go, no, you're an entertainer. You're there to yeah. entertain people. Take a, take a, just tell some jokes. Just be funny. But, but I've seen you go into a thing and within two seconds, you said, they told me not to say this and this, made a joke and, and, and everyone's laughing. You go, you think that's bad. Wait till what's next. I mean, is that, yeah, but, but that's in the framework that's, of your, of that framework of your nature. No, but that, that, you know, that was, that's like sometimes, sometimes you're paid to do a corporate and it's quite a stiff company. You can you also, I mean, you've got a certain spider sense after 20 years of comedy Fine. where you go, these guys, these guys, they're going to be fine with this. Fine. They don't know what they want. They've said they don't want this, but I know they want it. It's also that thing of you go, no one's ever that offended by my stuff because of the frequency. Yes. Because it's coming so thick and fast. You go, oh, I'm not sure about that joke. Oh, there's another one. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. I forgot what I was offended by. I've just yeah. moved. They've moved on. Oh, fine. So you see, so again, with the corporate world stuff, you're sort of not... It's not one level for something, as you said. You, you, you're, you're quite happy just to be yourself again in that environment. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's not that I haven't upset people over the years. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I have. And I'm sure that people are listening to this that went, oh, yeah, he was at my company, dude. It was a disgrace. But, <laughs> you know, the only measure of that is getting booked back. The and you only get booked measure all the time. is, the only metric is, oh, yeah, we want him again because everyone had a great night. They really laughed and they liked it. Great. Do you have any pitfalls to avoid? You know, so I assume when you're working, you would never drink in those evenings or, or you know, sort of stay, stay on water, you know. I would drink, I drink after a show. I mean, I, I, I used to drink at all and uh, I, I drink a little bit now. I would drink like, if I'm somewhere interesting, if I'm like in, I don't know, uh, Latvia doing a show or Prague for the evening, I go, well, this is interesting. Well, let's go out and see what we can find. And, you know, a little bit of that. If it's like around the UK and you're, I mean, I tend to, Driving keeps you honest because you're just up and down the motorways. But never before a show. That would be lunacy. I wondered, if you, have you ever done a show drunk and you've just gone, fuck it, and come up, you know, sort of slurring and just getting into people? No. no. Ever the I, professional. I, I never would. I just wouldn't walk on. No. I'd rather, I'd rather cancel the show than go on drunk because a lot of what I do is about speed. It's, it's like, it's partly, it's a trick, right? So you're, you're there and people go, wow, this guy's funny. And you go, well, I've got 300 jokes I've written for this evening in there. And then I've also got, if anything comes up in the audience, lightning quick responses, because I've trained for this. And I know there's only, there's only 30 things that could be shouted. So I, I know what's going to kind of happen. So you do have that arsenal, because I was going to ask you, I know we, we, we're gonna, you've got to finish now, but just like with, with the heckling, do you, do you mind that kind of heckling? Or is it just another opportunity oh, you if you show I, yourself? I mean, I, it's my favorite thing in the world. I don't have a monopoly on having a sense of humor, right? So you come and see me live and, uh, you know, if you want to jo- join in, join in. I mean, 
I might win, you might win. Great, as long as everyone's laughing. And again, it's intent. It's a weird thing with intent and people being offended. Like, you could be at a comedy show and you could say to someone, oh, I fucked your mum. They know the intention is just to have fun. They know we're just messing around. We're friends here. There's an intimacy to that. And so it's it's all fun. What's the best heckle you've know, ever had? I know when they shout something horribly aggressive out, it's the same thing. We're just having fun here. What's the, the best heckle you've had? Can you remember off the top of your head anything that's... I think it was like Edinburgh. It's like a million years ago now. And someone shouted at late night. And the gig doesn't start till one in the morning. And someone shouted, my mum died of cancer. And I went, well, I wasn't talking about mums. And I wasn't talking about cancer. And he went, no, but it was funnier than this. Oh, my God. What did you do? Tip your I hat laughed. to him. I, I laughed, same as everyone else in the room. Fucking great. <laughs> Mate, he I... won. He absolutely won. I love that, mate. That's incredible. Listen, Jimmy, I appreciate you so much coming on. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't say anything funny. We go into a really interesting, no, fun conversation I, 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 about life. I wanted to talk about that. I, I think, you know, look, you, you know, everyone knows if they want to find your funny stuff, they can, they can find it online. I think it's really interesting to meet the, the, the person behind that because, you know, the considered approach you take, um, obviously the you know, amazing career you've had. If, have you got any, t- you've got a tour coming out, anything to, to plug, anything that we should look out for? No, I mean, there'll be, I'll be back on the road, I think, as soon as we open up, I think June 21st, I'll be on the road uh, every night for the next, maybe, I don't know, maybe three or four years, let's see how it goes. Do you want to and do then, a mega tour again? Like, have you, you know, the, do you do those kind of big, you know, the, you know, because obviously a lot of comedians do the TV work, they do the little bits and pieces, but say more often than not, they absolutely enjoy a mega sort of tour. I, I don't do arenas, I just do, I do theatres. That's my thing, but I'll do them, yeah, I'll be, I'll be back on the road. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, man. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you soon. Thank I'll you. See you uh, I'll see you at physio, dude. Yeah, you will, you will do. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, that was Jimmy Carr. I'm James Haskell. You listen to What a Flanker, the podcast. Please share. Please subscribe. Don't forget, it's a YouTube show as well. Pick up the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. And remember, my book, What a Flanker, is out now as a paperback. <laughs>